Hi everyone, today I'm gonna to talk about if quantum computing can kill Bitcoin. And this is a topic I get a ton of. Uh, Plan B, 100 trillion USD, the Twitter account, he pulled his users and after governments banning Bitcoin, this was the number two concern. So I figured I needed to write about it and dig in on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my shared screen and let me uh, close this out of the way. All right, so this comes out on the Held Report. The Held Report is my weekly newsletter that comes out on Thursdays. Subscribe there to get it first. Uh, there's a link below and there should be a little button hovering here. Can quantum computing kill Bitcoin? All right, well, let's dig into the basics a little bit. Computers we have today have are called classical processors, which operate in bits that can either be a zero or a one. Quantum computing has quantum bits or quibits. These are an encoded zero or one or both, which allows for exponentially uh, faster processing of some types of mathematical problems. In 1994, this guy named Peter Shor came up with an algorithm called Shor's algorithm that could demonstrate that quantum computers could maybe crack encryption someday. And this led to researchers worrying that, you know, if you could crack encryption, all of a sudden you could crack uh, bank codes, nuclear launch codes, and Bitcoin. But, um, you know, below I'm going to dig into a little bit more about as to why this isn't a huge worry. So, First of all, quantum computing is extremely experimental. Like it is, we are hypoth we're talking about hypothetical scenarios here. For example, like running a quantum computer re it requires running a computer at barely above zero, which are above absolute zero. Absolute zero, by the way, is negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 273 degrees Celsius. And there's other things like various issues like coherence and life half-life that interfere with the stability of the qubits as you add more qubits. And these are very far from being fixed and are only theoretically solvable. Um, or, you know, it's something that's possible, but it's very, very expensive and very hard to do. Um, it may not be for hundreds of years. For example, like we know we'll colonize, eventually colonize the planets. We just know it might take a really long, really long time. Um, there's also really bad scalability. So in the Lex Friedman episode, he interviewed uh, Scott uh, Aronson, a theoretical computer scientist who stated that Google's top quantum computer only has 53 qubits, but a computer that would crack public private key encryption or other types of encryption that Bitcoin has would require thousands to millions of qubits uh, in order to attack it and, and, you know, really crack Bitcoin's code. So let's say we could actually build a stable quantum computer, scalable. Uh, what types of encryption are at risk? Well, for Bitcoin, it's SHA-256. Bitcoin's mining algorithm and ECDSA, which is the uh, way that you control your Bitcoin, the public private key that you have that this is the uh, private key signature that you have in order to move your coins. All right. So SHA-256, the hashing algorithm, most experts actually agree that this is extremely unlikely to occur. Uh, so this is the article that I linked to. Um, I'll link to this below. But basically, people, uh, most scientists th don't think that there's a way to crack hashing, uh, hashing in a way that a quantum computer would have an advantageous way to do that. Um, but even if it was possible, Bitcoin actually has something called the difficulty adjustment, which adjusts for this sort of thing. So what the difficulty adjustment does is as more and more folks start mining Bitcoin, it makes the um, proof of work essentially like the level of difficulty you need to achieve to earn a Bitcoin block go higher. What that means is as more and more computers start to mine, it becomes harder and harder to mine a Bitcoin. And that's Bitcoin's self-equilibrating mechanism to bring Bitcoin's supply issuance into check and also the blocks to be relatively timed around 10 minutes. Um, now, the adjustment occurs every 216 blocks. And that's about two weeks ish. Um, so what could happen though is like, let's say an alien species came down to earth with their huge computer, or we created a quantum computer and they started to mine Bitcoin. Well, they would mine the first next or the next 2016 blocks, depending on what part of the cycle we're in or all the way up until the next uh, <laughs> difficulty adjustment. And then Bitcoin's protocol would adjust to that level of increased computing power. Um, now, Bitcoin can't actually scale past a factor of four. And I found this out after writing this article. It can't have a difficulty adjustment that's over 4x, the last difficulty adjustment. So it might take a little while to catch up, but eventually it would catch up to this massive increase in computing power. Um, what's really interesting is that Bitcoin's, as its Bitcoin's hash rate has climbed, we can see here that the difficulty has climbed 
but the circulating supply of Bitcoin doesn't change. And that circulating supply looks very precise, and that's precise because of the difficulty adjustment. All this, all this, the difficulty adjustment adjusts as more mining power comes online. Um, and what's interesting is that Bitcoin has gone through this before. Bitcoin has gone through the CPU to GPU to ASIC era. And so a quantum computer would just be the next era in this. Um, so ultimately, Bitcoin SHA-256 is not at risk from quantum mining or from quantum computing. All right, for the next more serious one, elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, ECDSA. So this is what you use to, this is the type of encryption that you use to control your Bitcoin wallet. Quantum computers will likely impact this encryption algorithm first. The risk here is that a quantum computer could derive the private key from a public key. Um, now, that, and again, this is very theoretical. This would only be if they have thousands to millions of qubits and you know this is a, a, a very theoretical outcome, but let's say that all happened and that this this is true. Um, which type of bit, how will Bitcoin be affected? Well, the old transactions will be the ones that are exposed first. So these old Bitcoin transactions expose the public key when transacting. Um, with the newer type of transactions, it actually takes a hash of your private key, and that's where the unspent output that's that's what that that has is your the hash of your private key. Um, or that, that transaction has the hash of your private key. And so these are actually quantum resistant because as we mentioned before, we don't believe that quantum, uh, in, in, uh, quantum computing will be able to, um, you know, uh, essentially crack hashing and SHA-256. SHA so, um, but they can crack public keys. Now, here we can see the transition, and this is from this website, really great transaction fee.info. We can see the transition of this gray, this whitish gray, older type of transaction through to the newer ones that are a little bit more resistant. Now, they're not exactly resistant though. Um, they still have a little bit of flaws. For example, when you transact, um, you still, you still, when you move your coins, there's still a 10 minute window uh, where the, the, so the private key is exposed when you s transact. So the only way to get around that would be to Whenever you transact, you have to send all of your Bitcoin to different new addresses versus sending any in, in sort of a reusable address, which, by the way, is, is considered bad, bad practice anyways. Um, so, yeah, um, digging in like what happens, what happens next? So let's say we could build this, this quantum computer and it's starting to influence, um, let's say, ECDSA. What can we do about it? Well, in a post-quantum world, and that's what they call post-quantum cryptography, is the moment after crypt, uh, quantum computers created. Folks have already seen this along, ahead, uh, like way, way in the future, and they've already started a plan around it. So NIST, they're the ones who come up with uh, different types of mathematical standards, including encryption standards. They've been thinking about this for over a decade, and they're, they currently have a site where they're talking about, they even have conferences where they go through different types of encryption algorithms that will be quantum resistant. So you know, let's say this all happens. What can Bitcoin do? Bitcoin can upgrade. We can upgrade to a quantum resistant algorithm and everyone would have a certain amount of time to move their coins out of the old addresses that are exposed and we can move them to these new addresses that are quantum resistant. Now, what happens to the old coins that haven't moved? That would be a political decision based on the community and what do we do with these coins? Um, more than likely, they would probably maybe just burn them or make them essentially gone. Um, and I think that would be, I think that would be a, a wise move because if someone had these quantum computing uh, algorithms, they could be able to come in and crack those Bitcoin, including Satoshi's coins and keep them for their own. Um, but that would be a decision that would need to be based on the community. It's not one person that decides that. It's not a group of people. It's everyone comes together and thinks through what would happen. But to summarize, quantum computing is highly experimental. We'll know far in advance before it is actually a threat to Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is already protected against some of these attacks. And finally, if there is truly an if this all happened, Bitcoin could simply upgrade. Hope you enjoyed the uh, conversation today. Cheers.